Okay, class, we are actually one minute late. I apologize. Um, and we are going to continue through this uh, air control uh, in uh, hydronic systems. I know this probably gets a little, uh, a little dry, but it's uh, really fundamental stuff. If anybody ever winds up out there and actually designing HVAC systems, this is, this is fundamental stuff that a, it, a lot of people don't, don't that certainly that come out of school have not been exposed to this. So I think it's, I think it's worth doing. And so y'all, y'all stay with me here. Um, so the, I went back a couple of slides just to kind of, kind of review uh, from where we've been. Um, we know that uh, water expands upon heating, direct proportion to temperature change. And so we have to accommodate that expansion in, in volume. Um, the piping system will expand, you heat it up a little bit, but not near as much as the water. So we've got to have some volume out there. And that's the compression tank that the water can expand into. And pressure will rise in the, as it expands, it's gonna increase the pressure in that compression tank. Uh, up to, you know, if it's designed properly, it will go up to a design maximum, which will not blow the relief valve. Um, so compression tank acts like a spring on the system, keeping pressure on at all times. Uh, oops, let me see now, come on. There we go. Okay, uh, if the tank's too small, we just get to an excessive pressure increase and we maybe start blowing water out of the system, which we really don't wanna do. Uh, if tank's too large, pressure increase may not be enough as the system heats up and it's, it's possible uh, that we could actually get cavitation in the pump. Probably not likely, but you know, theoretically at least it's possible. Uh, using the minimum fill pressures given in table A will provide adequate pressurization at the pump regardless of uh, pressure increases produced by the compression tank. That last bullet says that, you know, some people don't uh, potentially increase the cold fill pressure at the top based on how hot the system's gonna be and just rely on the compression tank um, pressure increase to handle the protection of the pump, but it does not recommend doing that. That's why we had that uh, table A someplace back. There we go, that was table A. So anyway, I'll figure out where I was. Okay, so, you know, going through in a little more detail, we have to determine the amount of uh, water volume in the system. And uh, these slides give you a couple different ways to do it. This, this table uh, is based on the MBH, they the, the, do it on a cooling system too, but it assumes a, a certain number of BTUs per hour and it assumes a 20 degree cis, uh, delta T uh, across your heating coils and all that stuff. And I mean, it's a pain in the rear. Uh, I would never use this and I don't really recommend that you do. But anyway, there are tables like this out there. What I would do and what calculate the amount of water in the system. So you, can, you, you have tables like this that are handy. You know, you can put this in Excel and, uh, you know, based on the uh, diameter of the pipe, like schedule 40 is kind of standard uh, steel pipe. If it's a half inch, um, it gives you gallons per linear foot. And so you just put that table in there and then you, you know, go through your system and say, well, I got, you know, 150 feet, a half inch pipe. That's so many gallons. I got, you know, a thousand feet of, you know, two inch pipe times 0.17, that's how many gallons. And you just add it up. And then for your boiler, your heat exchangers, all that sort of thing, you can get specs uh, on a particular piece of equipment and you just add it up. So it's not hard to determine the amount of water in the system, especially with all the computational tools we have today. Um, compression tank size and closed system. And I, we've said this, before uh, the system water volume, system temperature change and the allowable pressure increase. Uh, a minimum initial tank pressure is possible if the tank can be installed at the top of the system because you don't have the static head of the water sitting on, on top of the tank. Uh, tank installed at the bottom of the system will have additional pressure on it equal to the static 
uh, height of water above it. And if it's cold water, <laughs> it's, it's 2.31, um, 2.31 what feet. Every 2.31 feet gives one PSI of additional pressure. So, you know, and then if it's hotter water, it'll be a little bit less because what hotter water is a little less dense and you can multiply by the specific gravity uh, to adjust for water temperature if you need to. Um, one additional factor must be considered uh, if heated system water is permitted to rise by gravity freely into the compression tank, uh, causing the water temperature in the tank to rise, the air or nitrogen, whatever it is, the gas within the tank will expand and that'll increase the pressure. So we, get, we need some means to keep hot water because I mean, if this is a high temperature water, we could have 200, 250 degree water circulating through there and we don't want that hot water to get up in that compression tank because then it'll cause that air to expand and then we'll have to have a much bigger tank if we let the water get hot. So that's kind of the game here. And he goes through this little, uh, you know, basically ideal gas equation. Uh, he runs a little uh, example here. So let's say V and V1, I would have called it V1 and V2, but anyway, I took this out of Bell and Gossett. So they call it V and V1. Tank volume and two similar systems remain constant. So we're gonna let V and V1 equal each other, okay? Well, if they're equal to each other, we can divide through and you know we can get rid of them. So we'll get P over T is equal to P1 over T1. And then we're gonna say, what happens to uh, tank pressure P1 when tank temperature T1 increases from 70 to 150 and the initial pressure was 12. And so he sets V equal to V1 and that disappears. So if you run, it's just, uh, you know, P over T is equal to P1 over T1. And don't forget, you have to use absolute pressures and temperatures because this is like an ideal gas law thing. And if you do, and this is for the air in the tank, okay? So this, you know, we're writing this for the air. And so you solve it and you say that P1 uh, is 16 instead of 12. So it went up, what, four? I can do <laughs> arithmetic in my head. Uh, plus, and I would not have thought of this, but you think about it for a minute with your psychometrics, it's true. Plus there is an increase in water vapor pressure of four PSIG. So if you look up <clears throat> the saturation, and I did this and I'm not gonna break out of my presentation. Um, I looked up the saturation pressure at 70 Fahrenheit and on my little calculator, it comes back, it's four tenths of a PSI, okay? And then I looked it up at 150, and it's actually, I think, 0.7. So the increase is really about 3.3, <clears throat> but Bell and Gossett exaggerated it to four. So I'll cut them a little slack, you know? So anyway, so they're saying that that wind up with 20 PSIG, as your initial pressure in that tank instead of 12. Well, let's say that your uh, max pressure is 30. That's a common number. <clears throat> so all of a sudden your allowable increase, instead of being 18, which is 30 minus 12, it's gonna be what? It's gonna be 10. And so if you're, I mean, your allowable pressure increase has dropped almost 50%. And so that tank's gonna to have to get considerably larger if you let this water get hot inside the tank. Okay. <clears throat> so this pressure increases the, uh, this pressure increase of the airspace reduces the allowable pressure range uh, of system water expansion. So either the tank size uh, or maximum system working pressure must be increased. So you gotta do something. Okay, but aha. Uh -huh. Bell and Gossett to the rescue here. There, an uh, alternative solution would be to provide a means to prevent the tank temperature from rising. <clears throat> Some means of keeping the tank near ambient temperature should be used. And of course, this is by 
Bell and Gossett, so they're going to advertise their fittings. So they make what Bell and Gossett calls an air troll tank fitting to serve this purpose. So what these fittings do, they restrict gravity circulation of hot water into the compression tank while allowing free passage of air bubbles to rise into the tank because that's how you're going to separate and keep the air out of the system. Uh, the circulating piping, so uh, we're going we're gonna to let those air bubbles pass through into the compression tank, but we don't want the hot water to be able to gravity circulate. Air troll fittings are a good investment uh, in that they reduce compression tank size on most systems. And so uh, here's a little picture. This is out of a different presentation, but it's a pretty nice little picture. And I mean, I don't understand exactly how these things work. And you don't have to either. You just, uh, you know, the design engineer doesn't have to be able to uh, design all of the components, the valves and the fittings and all, but he, he has to understand, you know, what they're there for and that he needs them and, you know, what the purpose is and all that sort of thing. And then you can always call up Bell and Gossett if you have more detailed questions about it. So the, these prevent gravity circulation, therefore keeping uh, tank water at room temperature. And that's what we're concerned with. And you see in the little picture, the air bubbles can somehow get through this thing, but the gravity circulation, not so. Uh, these are <laughs> some more detail, almost like photos uh, that were in the original Bell and Gossett uh, literature I took this from. So a little more detail and they make a couple different models. They have the ATF air troll tank fitting and the ATFL. And I don't really know the difference between them. Looks like they're constructed a little bit differently. But, you know, Bell and Gossett can certainly uh, uh, point you to the one that you would need for a particular application, as well as other manufacturers. Doesn't have to be Bell and Gossett. Okay, so uh, here's an equation. And I believe if I had to uh, do this uh, on a system, I'd just program the equation and be done with it. After this, we've got umpteen different little tables and you can you know, pull out of this table and a correction factor out of that table and a correction factor out of that table. But yeah, again, then in this day and time, I'm, they probably have, I'm sure they have calculators out there online that have all this stuff progr programmed into it. But anyway, you could, this would be pretty darn easy to uh, program. Uh, and so, um, there you have it. The V sub T is the compression tank size in gallons. And you remember the, the, the term in uh, parentheses, the E sub W minus E sub P, that's the expansion of the water minus the expansion of the pipe. And we had a, a table for that. And again, I'm sure you can find uh, uh, lots of references to, to be able to get that, that number, that E sub W minus E sub P. Uh, v sub S is just the uh, volume of the system in gallons. And then we're going to divide uh, by that P sub A divided by P sub F. Well, P sub A is atmospheric pressure, PSIA. So it could be 14, 14.7, 14 you know, whatever you're going to use for your uh, atmospheric pressure. And P sub F would be the initial pressure in the tank. Um, and PSIA, and then we're going to have that minus P sub A divided by P sub O, again, atmospheric pressure divided by the final pressure, usually the relief valve setting in P PSIA. And then this, this minus 0.02 V sub S, that's uh, approximately the amount of air uh, that will be released from the new system upon uh, heat up, about 2% of the water volume. So that's an equation you can use um, to just calculate your required uh, compression tank size. Or we can go to table E, F, and G. That uh, equation above. Uh, and it is for, and these are kind of standard conditions, but again, any particular project or building may well be may may be well off of the these and you know would have to be adjusted. But a fairly common would be 12 psig initial pressure on the tank, 
assumed to be at the level of the relief valve. So the relief valve is right there. And see so its initial pressure would be 12. Uh, we've got a 30 PSIG relief valve setting, which means the uh, maximum allowable system pressure increase is the difference or 18. Uh, must be recalled that the allowable system pressure increase is dictated by the maximum minimum conditions at the pressure relief valve with the pump in operation. Okay, because you know, when you're running the system, the pump's going to have to run. Okay, if a system is to operate at conditions other than those used in table E, table F will provide a correction factor for us. Uh, I, I put this. Uh, system diagram in here because this we went through this before the elevation change and uh, came up with the uh, 12 PSIG is down here at our uh, that's our cold water coming in that's our pressure relief valve that sets the 12 here all this kind of ties in together at about the same uh, elevation so we're going to have 12 in here and all this here's our pump and we'll talk later this becomes our uh, point of no pressure change relative to pump operation and all this. But so this is kind of a picture of the standard uh, setup. So we got 12 PSIG and we can go to 30. Uh, and so if that's your condition, then you simply come over here and figure out, and you can interpolate between these. Let's say we had a thousand gallons in the system and our mean water temperature, okay, mean water temperature is the supply to the coil, the average of the supply to the coil and the return from the coil. So often, we often design around a 20 degree Delta T. So if you had for that first column, you might have 160 supply and 140 return. So your mean water would be 150. So, you know, you might have, uh, <clears throat> You might have 180 supply and uh, 160 return, which would be 170, which means you'd have to interpolate between the, the 160 and 180 columns. But anyway, so for your appropriate mean water temperature and total volume in gallons, you simply read. So, you know, let's say we're 180 mean water and we're a thousand gallons. So that would say we would need a 100 gallon expansion tank if we're initially 12 and relief valve is 30 with an 18 PSI increase allowable, okay? All right. Now, this is, if, if we're not on those standard conditions, then we can get a correction factor here, okay? So we can look at, uh, we might have, let's see, do I have a, okay. Um, let's say allowable system pressure increase, maybe it's only 10, okay? And the initial uh, pressure on the compression tank is 18. Well, then I come over here and I'd have to take that volume from uh, table E and multiply by 2.2 to adjust it, okay? So these are just correction factors. Uh, let's see. Uh, for tanks selected from table E, use this table, or I guess there's a figure 18. I'm not sure what that is off the top of my head. To obtain appropriate correction factor, multiply uh, factor by compression tank size for me to obtain proper tank size. Okay, so I think that's pretty straight. Um, so now <clears throat> if we have ethylene glycol, or there's also a propylene glycol. So they don't have a separate table. If I had propylene glycol, I'd have to do a little digging and make sure that the same correction factor was good for both. But this one is for ethylene glycol, which is basically, you know, keeps your system from freezing. <laughs> if you're in Alaska or even, even if you're in Tennessee, I mean, if you're, you know, say, cooling tower water or something like that. Um, you, you have to be concerned, or if you got pipes going outside that aren't uh, heat traced, or terribly well insulated, you have to be concerned. So anyway, uh, this is another uh, correction factor. Uh, use factor from table to correct estimated system volume before selecting compression tank 
from um, table E. Okay, so let's see, this is F. And, you know, it could be that you have to correct, start at E, correct at F, and then correct again at G. <laughs> oh, me. So, anyway, this is the percent uh, by volume of ethylene glycol, and you see roughly the uh, freeze protection. If you're 10%, you can go down to 25 before you freeze. Um, 20. 20% is 16, 33% is zero, and 50% is minus 34. So I guess if you're in Alaska, you're probably doing 50% to, to be on the safe side. And then uh, the maximum design temperature, uh, you just pull the factor. And now there's this double asterisk here. Use 150 uh, F column for temps below 150. Okay, so even if it's not this high, go ahead and use this and you'll be conservative. Uh, interpolated from Union Carbide's data book. I guess Union Carbide knows something about ethylene glycol. I would expect so. I think they probably manufactured it. Okay, uh, let's see. So there's some notes here. Let's run through the collection. Simply a matter of estimating system volume, determining maximum uh, mean design temperature for uh, for many systems, the mean design temperature can be considered to exist throughout the system. Uh, the mean design water temperature is then the average of the design supply and return temperatures. For example, the 220 maximum uh, temperature system design for a 20 degree drop would have 210 as the mean design temperature. So, you know, it's 220 in, it's 200 out, the average is 210. Uh, for complicated systems such as multi zone, primary, secondary pumping systems, <clears throat> the calculation of the mean design water temperature is more involved. Table E, and we'll talk about that. We've got an example or two here. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, table E is based on compression tank sizes required for a system water heated from a low temperature of 40. So that's the basis of that table E. Uh, but again, we, we have an equation we can use. So let's simplify this a little bit. Uh, I guess if you had glycol, you'd still have to use the glycol correction factor, even with the equation. Okay, tank selection tables method. Um, for a multi-zone system that has a variety of maximum design temperatures, a simple method is to estimate the water volume of the components having the same maximum temperature and determine the required compression uh, tank size from table E, then total the compression tank volume uh, required for the entire system. So you may have uh, a part of a loop that may be like a, in primary, secondary, your primary loop <laughs> to just distribute the heat out to say different buildings may have maybe 200, 300 degrees, and it may come back 180, 160. Well, but then, so you would have one compression tank based on that, but then when you get to the individual buildings, you may take that in and it, you may uh, temper it and you may circulate it at say 180 and bring it back at 160. So you'd have different, so, or you, you can, within the same building, you can have primary, secondary, it doesn't have to be different buildings. So then you can calculate a volume for each one of those particular things and total it up. And then that would size the uh, compression tank. Okay. And just know you may need your correction factors. Okay. So selection procedure, estimate water volume, calculate. Uh, use the 150 Fahrenheit column if your uh, design water temperature so is below 50. So if you're doing a chill water system, uh, Bell and Gossett would recommend going ahead and uh, assuming 150 because that's the situation where the building the cooling system goes down and it's hot weather, the building could potentially heat up. Now it's probably not gonna heat up to 150, okay. So, but you're still gonna be conservative uh, in this and it's gonna work fine. Uh, step three, table E is based on compression tank and pressure relief valve installed at approximately the same level for 
12 initial, uh, 30 relief valve. For other conditions, we have to do that. We had a primary secondary system designed so that <clears throat> the boiler and primary piping has 500 gallons of water uh, and a 240 to 200 design temperature range, or a mean would be 220. Uh, it supplies secondary piping circuits that uh, operate at a design temperature range of 150 to 140. So that's a 10 degree, uh, but we can't, we're not gonna go below, so we're gonna use the 150 column. Secondary circuits uh, have 275 gallons of water. Uh, initial tank pressure, we got our standard condition. So we're in table E, 12 to 30. Uh, so we've got an 18 allowable increase. And so uh, they're pulling some numbers. So five, 500 gallons at 220, table E should be 80. So let's go running back here. We, there it is. Okay, so here's 500 gallons, 220 right there. And so bingo, they just pull 80 out of the table. And let's see, the other one is uh, 275. Said so we're close to 300. I think if you do the math, I think he pulls 18 and it's uh, 140 to 150. So he's in the minimum column. So he's going to interpolate and he comes out of this with 15, I believe. Oh, I've got two different numbers on uh, secondary. I got 275 there and 250. Okay, well, <laughs> the slide, sorry. Uh, at any rate, so for that second, uh, the secondary, he's pulling 15. If you do the interpolation at 250, it's right. So uh, I suspect I need to change that slide, apologies. So anyway, then you just add those together and then he says, well, 95 is not a standard size. So you go up to the next standard size, which would be 100. That's what you would spec, and you don't forget your uh, air troll tank fitting. So, uh, here's another little example, 2000 DPM uh, uh, at 180 mean design temperature requires 200 um, from table E, and we can go back and check it, but I'm not gonna run back on all these. However, the initial pressure on the tank will be four PSIG and the allowable system uh, pressure increase will be eight PSIG. So we're gonna have um, 22 on the initial at the relief valve and it's gonna be set on 30. So we only got an eight PSIG increase. And so uh, I guess we can run back to table F and see we should get a correction factor of 0.8. So we got an eight PSIG increase at 180. Uh, so here's our initial tank is was four yeah, allowable increase. So he's pulling that number right there at 0.8, and that's 80 percent. I think. Uh, he came out with 200 gallons from table E, eight tenths of that's 160, but 160 is not a standard size, 180 is, so he's going to put a 180 in with the air troll fitting. A chill water system, uh, closed hermetically sealed system is uh, design is needed by a chill water system, just like we got to have a closed system for hot water. Um, so chill water has relatively small temperature range. Some designers don't put compression tanks in there. And Bill Gossett says, this is a mistake, explanation point. So, and the compression tank also establishes a reference pressure point for pump operation, which we'll talk about here in a minute. So the compression tank is needed. And so go to the minimum temperature, column, which is 150 and do your selection. Uh, so here's another little example, 200 gallons, standard pressures, 
18 PSID increase. Uh, so if you go to table E, use the 150 column, you get 12 gallons. And that's uh, a standard size. So that's what you put in. <clears throat> Uh, antifreeze, you know, we've, we've talked about this. I think we've got an example or two here. Let's see. Uh, when selecting compression tank for a sealed ethylene glycol and water system, the conventional compression tank uh, with as few openings uh, in the tank as possible and none above the water line should be used. Required tank size increase. And of course, we got table G for the correction factors. And, you know, so we can use E, F, and G. Okay, here's a little example. System volume is 100 gallons of 50% F. Design, <laughs> design temperature is 160. And so uh, table F, you know, I think that's table G. Let's see. Let's see. So this is 50. Another, another mistake in the slides. So here's our 50, and here's our 160 uh, being water. So there's the 1.73. See, does that? Yeah, that's correct. But that this slide should say table G and not table F. Uh, interpolating an E gives a tank size of uh, 14, and the closest standard is 15. So you can work through that. These are all pretty straightforward. Uh, so location of the compression tank. It's affected by two separate considerations. One, vertical uh, placement of the tank in the building. We've talked about that a bunch. If the tank is placed too low, we got static pressure is high and we need a larger tank. We put it high up on, on top, then we, the, we don't have the static on it. So static pressure, so we get a smaller tank. Uh, tank's vertical position affects only tank size. Second point, uh, point of connection to the system. And these are, these are pretty important. Uh, point of connection to the piping system is the point of air separation where free air is removed from the system. So we need to note that for sure. And the point of connection is also the point of no pressure change for the system regarding pressures produced by pump operation. So all three of those, vertical location in terms of static pressure, air separation, and point of no pressure change. All important. Okay, so consider a basic pump compression tank, supply return pipe, and then radiation. Radiation means coils or radiators or something to dissipate the heat in the space. Uh, except for the compress for the compression tank, the system is full of water. Uh, when water is heated, it expands, as we know, an additional. Uh, water enters the compression tank because that's what it's there for. It's got that air cushion in there and that's the only place it can really enter. And so it does. So here's our little loop. So this is going to be what our point of no pressure change right here. And all of this is full of water. I've got this air cushion over here in the tank, turn on the pump and it pumps around the loop. And, you know, I've got radiators and other stuff. I just simplified the diagram. Okay, what happens to the pressure in the compression tank when the pump starts? The pump is located so that the compression tank is on its discharge side, like we're showing here. Does the pump pressure compress the air within the compression tank further, thereby increasing its pressure? Well, I would have thought this when I first saw this. I thought, well, yeah, sure, turn the pump on, pressure's going to go up. Well, the answer is no, because, it, and we had a slide earlier that talked about this, um, because to compress air within uh, the tank, it's first necessary to add water to the tank. 
starting the pump does not add water to the system and without additional water, the tank pressure cannot change. So that's a big concept in all of this. And if it doesn't make sense to you, I'm sorry, it didn't make sense to me, but I just memorized it and I learned it and now I accept it. <laughs> I don't know if intuitively I ever would have come up with that. Uh, maybe you would have, uh, I hope so. But either way, uh, that's what you're here for is to learn stuff and that's something you need to learn out of these slides. Okay. Okay, we recognize that pump operation does not affect compression uh, tank pressure. In other words, compression tank is a point of no pressure change as far as pump operation in the system is concerned. Thus, if the compression tank pressure does not change when the pump starts, then the pressure in the line connecting the compression tank to the piping does change. So this becomes the point of no pressure change in a closed circulating water system with respect to pump operation. So right there, that little red arrow is pointing. You can start the pump or you can turn the pump on and off. You put a pressure gauge, you're not gonna see a change in pressure. Okay. Now, what happens at every other point in the system when you turn the pump on? Every other point in the system does see a increase or Depending on where you put the tank, you could see a decrease in pressure. We'll talk about that in a second. And so where you put that relief valve, if that relief valve is someplace downstream of that pump and you turn that pump on, then that relief valve is gonna see a pressure increase. And that's gonna affect the allowable on your system, okay. Uh, the recommended point of connection of the compression tank to the piping system is on the suction side of the pump as close to the pump as possible, okay? So we wanna get close to the suction and the system. The stretch of pipe from the connection of the compression tank to the suction flange on the pump is the only area or the only length of piping would have been better to say, experiencing reduced pressure resulting from pump operation. So we got a little system here and we got a little graph over here showing pressure. Okay, so let's start over here. So, and this is a blow up of just the suction side, just this little area right here, this is a blow up so we can see it a little better. Okay. Uh, and so the dash line shows the pressure, okay? And so this is our point of no pressure change. Well, coming into this point, you know, we've got frictional falling and we hit the point of no pressure change. So the pressure net doesn't change here, but guess what? This the water at this point is being sucked into, did that thing change? That that on slides. It's just touch bad, it's touchy. Okay, so that water <laughs> is being sucked. You know, the lowest pressure is at the eye of the impeller. Okay, because that's what that pump does. It establishes really low pressure. And then it flings that water to the outside and then the pressure jumps up. You got velocity and pressure and then you slow it down and you get more the velocity turns into more pressure, okay? So the lowest pressure point in the whole system is right here at the eye of the impeller or the suction flange. It doesn't really matter much. And so the only place that pressure goes down, if this is where you put your compression tank, is in this pipe as it flows from this point to the pump. And so we see that pressure going down, okay? And then we go through the pump. And of course the pump, the purpose of the pump is to establish this, this uh, jump up in pressure, right? And then it's that pressure that circulates the fluid around the loop. And so if you go up to the top diagram here, you kind of see the overall thing, you know, point of no pressure change. You get a little bit of a dip into the suction and see that it's that pressure at that suction that controls cavitation. Okay, that's why we want that pipe to be as short as possible 
because you know the point of connection of the compression tank is the point of no pressure change but the further we have to go to get to the suction of the pump the lower the pressure is going to fall before it gets to the pump and the more likely it is that we might cavitate the pump so we don't want to do that so we want to keep this piping from this point to the to the suction of the pump as short as possible okay but then then say we jump up uh, at the discharge of the pump and then this is a closed loop. And so then we just bleed that pressure off. And this is all frictional loss as we come around the loop. And we come all the way back and bingo, we're gonna come right back. And that compression tank is, is still fits all the same pressure and we didn't put any water in the tank, then everything will be the same here. And then we have that little bit of a dip before we get to the suction, as we get to the suction plant. Okay, if anybody has any questions, jump in. But this is pretty good stuff. People designing systems need to understand this stuff. Okay, uh, let's see, what else do we have? Okay. Uh, the bullets, uh, the distance from the point of no pressure change, the pump should be kept at the patient of the pump, the area or the pipe length. Uh, from the pump discharge to the tank connection point will experience a pressure increase due to pump operation. So all the way around the loop, you know, once we jump up at the pump, you know, you know co compared to having the pump, if we turn the pump off, then everything is just going to be, you know, if, if this is all at the same elevation, it's all going to be the same pressure, right? And then we turn it on and, and everything jumps up and then we bleed off that pump pressure with the friction and the water till we get back to that point. Pressure release valve installed in this area will be affected by pressure increases caused by pump operation. Uh, I've said that a bunch. Okay, well, okay. So this is your first design job and you get out there and dad gum it, I forgot. And I, in my piping drawing, I connected the compression tank to the pump discharge. Well, boss, is that gonna make a difference? Well, let's take a look at this and see. Uh, the answer is yes, because what's gonna happen now is your point of no pressure change is here, okay? And so basically what it does is it forces that pump head to go in the negative direction. And that's a great recipe to cavitate a pump because that pump head is going to be significant. So this is almost a guarantee that you're going to cavitate, especially if this is a hot water heating system that you're going to cavitate this pump. But it's kind of interesting, you know, on this side, when you put it back here, it holds this pressure. So pump head operates in the positive direction. Here, you're holding this pressure constant. And so the only thing that can happen is basically the pump head goes in the negative direction on the suction side, which is bad, bad, bad. You don't want to do that, okay? And so it's the same kind of an argument here. Um, you know, uh, as we come into the pump, we're at a really low pressure and the pump head jumps up a little bit uh, and then we bleed off that small amount of uh, positive pressure down to the compression tank because this point of pressure is held constant by the compression tank. So it'll be a little bit higher on the backside because we've got frictional losses in that pipe from the pump discharge to that connection point, but that's pretty, it'll be pretty minor. And then from that point on, we drive it down, 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 down all around until the lowest pressure is at the pump suction here. So this is what you don't want to do. If the compression tank is attached <clears throat> to the system on the discharge side of the pump, the point of no pressure change forces the pump differential pressure to act in the negative direction. This is obviously a bad situation that can lead to cavitation within the pump and poor circulation throughout the piping circuits. If, oh, this is a good point, I forgot. If automatic air vents are located in areas where 
uh, pump operation cause pressures below atmospheric, air can be sucked into the system. Well, that's what you want. That's what you don't want to do, you know? So that's another thing. You can suck air into the system because all these pressures are sub-atmospheric sub along in here in your piping. A good rule of thumb is always install the uh, system pumps so they operate away from the point of the compression tank connection. Okay. Okay. Good deal. And so here's some just little examples. <clears throat> so uh, compression <laughs> tank on suction side. So we turn the pump off, you know, everything. We got 30 PSIG on both gauges and uh, <clears throat> we turn the pump on. And so this compression tank holds it at 30 here. And this is real close, so there's not much of a pressure drop in between there. And then we get a 10 PSI jump because of the pump over here, which is what we want, okay? If you put the compression tank on the discharge side, we get 30 and 30. We turn it on, we get 30 and we get 20 over here, which is what we don't want. Okay. Pretty good. <clears throat> okay, what if you were to install multiple compression tanks? Hmm. Well, there's a thought. If one if one's good, two's got to be better, right? <laughs> well, okay. A uh, a second compression tank containing air is installed in the system. If uh, we get a second tank, tank pressure would be affected by pump operation. In this case, the circulating pump can transfer water from one tank. Uh, to the other in proportion to the pressure differential it can produce between the tanks. So not a good situation. You don't want to do it. Uh, the, the point of no pressure change, excuse me, <laughs> excuse me, <laughs> excuse me, goodness. That's all that spring, all that spring stuff is popping out there. Oh man, I snot up this time of year. Uh, the point of no pressure change uh, as a result of pump operation can move to a point somewhere in the system between two tanks and, and may, cha may change with changes in water level in the tanks. More than one connection to a single or multiple compression tank arrangement is not recommended. Uh, we don't want to do this. System containing a good deal of free air uh, in the piping and radiation can cause a similar reaction. Okay, so if you just don't evacuate your system, you get enough pockets of air out there, those pockets of air can act like an additional compression tank, especially if you got a big coil or something that's half full of air. So you could have a significant volume in a big coil. So you can make sure that you vent the system get some strange operation from that perspective as well, as well as if you have a coil that's airbound, then obviously it's not going to work very well. Uh, well, what if you have multiple pumps? Well, and so the comments here, if the operation of a single circulating pump uh, cannot change the pressure within the compression tank, then the operation of multiple pumps installed throughout the system will not affect a single point of no pressure change. So that doesn't matter. Uh, this single reference point, with this single reference point in mind for a uh, starting pressure, it's possible to determine the hydraulics and pressure gradients uh, for an entire system for primary secondary circuits. So knowing that that pressure is constant at that point and no pressure change is a big deal in, as you work your way around the system and want to know what the pressures are at different points. Ah, primary secondary. So this is our first clue of what primary secondary <laughs> might look like. So this would be your primary down here. So the boiler, let's say if this is a, a high temperature, a fairly, fairly high temperature uh, primary loop. So this might be 220, 250, 300 degree water being circulated out of here. Then what we can do is so that loop circulates just like we've been talking, comes back cooler, goes back to the boiler, compression tank and the whole deal. But we come over here and we can have multiple secondary circuits 
with individual little pumps that pull out here, pull out some of this water, circulate it around that actually heats the spaces and then puts it back in. Now this is showing a one pipe primary and, and it's possible. Most, most primaries are two pipe where they have a supply pipe and a return pipe. But anyway, we can, uh, we can do it this way as well. Um, and so when you connect this secondary, you want these connections to be as short as possible, okay? Because you don't want any pressure drop between these, between the, your secondary supply line coming off and your secondary return coming back in. Because if I don't want any heat in this circuit, I just turn this pump off. Well, and so the only thing that would cause uh, flow by this from the primary would be if there was a pressure drop. Well, if I make this a 10 foot section of pipe from here to here, there's gonna be pressure drop, right? Because I got frictional drop, you know, in my primary. Well, if I have a pressure difference from there to there, then that pressure difference will force a small amount of flow back up here and I'll flow my secondary when I don't want to. And so if the pump's off, it's because my secondary doesn't need any heat. I turn the pump off, but I got a pressure drop, so I get heat anyway. So I don't have I don't have good control on the secondary if I do that. So that's why we want these points of connection to be very very close together. Okay, uh, and this is becomes then the point of no pressure change for the secondary pump. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. So each secondary. Okay, that's pretty much what I said there. We talked about there. Let's look and see what the caption says here. Uh, pump operation affects tank sizing by its effect on the operating range of the pressure relief valve. If the relief valve is located at a point away from the point of no pressure change, <clears throat> the initial pressure placed upon it will be affected by uh, pump pressure as well as static height and uh, fill pressure applied at the high point in the system. Uh, that just kind of regurgitates what we already know. Um, when uh, possible, locate the relief valve close to the point of no pressure change. When this isn't done, calculate the additional pump pressure that will be placed on the relief valve and select the tank size accordingly, okay. So there we go, a little bit on primary secondary. Uh, let's see, note how the connection point for each secondary circuit to the primary circuit establishes the pressure in the secondary circuit. Uh, for the secondary pump <clears throat> to add its pressure differential throughout the secondary circuit, it must operate away from the connection to the primary. So say, this is operating away from the primary. So if we put it on this side, it would be pumping into the primary and then we would get that pressure in the negative direction. So we want this pump to pump away from this point of connection, just like we want this pump to pump away from the point of connection of the compression tank, because this is the point of no pressure change for the secondary. So you want the pump on this side almost all the time. We get into primary secondary, there's a few exceptions, but not many. Uh, the pressure loss between the secondary connections to the primary system should be kept as small as possible to minimize secondary flow when the pump is off. And I talked about that in some detail. Okay, so we're into the last little segment of this presentation, <clears throat> air separation. So as water is heated or cooled, air is released or absorbed in proportion to its temperature and pressure. And there's an example, if you have a clear glass and you go to the water cooler and you just fill it up like this, and then you set it on your desk and let it start heating up, well, it looks like this after a little while. And those are oxygen or nitrogen bubbles that are coming out of solution. So what we see, more gas and when it's at higher pressure the pressure can force gas into it so high pressure low temperature means a lot of uh, 
oxygen or nitrogen or air, or however you want to think about it, into solution in the water. So even in the low temperature range required for chill water uh, air conditioning systems, there is a change in solubility of air and water. Okay. But, you know, I used to, when I had everybody in the classroom, I, I had a glass and I'd go fill it up with water out of the water fountain and you set it on the table and let it warm up and you get to see the air bubbles come out. But you can, you can do this at home uh, if you want to. <clears throat> okay. So if anybody does deep sea diving, you have to worry about the bends. And if you go, if you don't go below like 30 feet, you worry about it. There's not enough pressure. But if you go below there for, an, for extended lengths of time, then you do have to worry about it. Uh, deep sea divers experience the effect of pressure changes on gas solubility during underwater ascents when they're down and they start coming up. So if they've been down there a while, that pressure drives additional nitrogen. Basically, it's nitrogen because they use up a lot of the oxygen. But so, it, so the nitrogen hangs around and gets driven into the bloodstream. Nitrogen does not combine with normal elements within the human body at atmospheric pressure. While diving, nitrogen is absorbed into the bloodstream under the increasing pressures of water depth. As the, driver, as the diver rises, the water pressure on the body is reduced and nitrogen expands proportionately. If the ascent is too fast, the expanded nitrogen gas does not have a chance to escape from the bloodstream and the so-called bends occur and that's you get all these nitrogen bubbles floating around in your bloodstream and it's not good for you. <laughs> it's, not, it's not a good look. You need to avoid that. Okay. The point where the compression tank connects to the system is the point of no pressure change, regardless of pump operation. This connecting point is important for another reason. Uh, it must also be the point of uh, separation of free air from the uh, system water. Effective air control design then takes into account these conditions which affect release and absorption of air and water for all systems. We need to understand the effect of air solubility in water under changing temperatures and pressures. Uh, air is roughly 20% oxygen, 80% nitrogen, 2179 really, but 2080 is fine. Uh, air within the closed system quickly will lose its oxygen via oxidation. Okay, so we talked about that earlier. You know, when you first fill a system, you've got air in it, but when you start circulating it around, you don't have to worry about the oxygen being there very long because oxygen is so reactive, uh, it'll find something to react with. And so it'll form a little bit of corrosion someplace. But, you know, if that's, if you don't, unless you have a constant source of oxygen, it's not enough to hurt anything on the initial fill. And so then you wind up with just nitrogen pretty much circulating around in the system because nitrogen doesn't react with much of anything, um, at least inside of a, a piping system. So unless uh, fresh water is added, the gas within the system is predominantly nitrogen. So that's what we're actually trying to control here. Okay, so here's the, here's the curve, and you need to we need to spend a little time, and you need to, you need to understand these curves. I mean, it's pretty straightforward. So let's look at the axis. So we just have temperature, uh, degrees Fahrenheit, on the x-axis, the y-axis. It's nitrogen uh, soluble in water. at zero PSI and 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So anyway, it just means basically how much nitrogen do we have in absorbed in the water, okay? And so let's start up here. Let's, let's pick a, well, I don't know. Well, we'll pick a high pressure. So all of this curve is at 150. Well, you can see that's the biggest curve. This is 30% up here, whoops. Uh, 20%, 15, 10, 5, and all that. 
in other words, up in here, you got a lot. Okay, well, look what happens. When it's cold, 50 degrees, uh, I guess that's zero. So this is probably about 40 degree water. Oh my gosh, this goes crazy. High pressure and low temperature, we have got a boatload of nitrogen in the water. Well, if we keep the pressure the same and we start heating it up, guess what? Man, we heat it up, we're driving it out. It's falling, it's falling like a rock. It's falling down here to, what is that, five? Uh, I don't know, it's about seven and a half percent all the way from up there about 30%. So there's still quite a bit in it at 300 degrees because the pressure is so high, okay? Well then look at what happens if we say, let's say, let's say we're at 50 degrees, we just start dropping pressure, okay? Keep the same temperature, 150, what's that? Down to 125, down to 100, you know, down to 75, down to 50. So say if we stay at the same temperature and drop pressure, this nitrogen is gonna come out of solution too. So we got two ways. We can heat it up, we drive it off, or we drop pressure, we drive it off, or we do both. And you know, maybe, maybe you're up in here and you wind up down in here, you could have a lot of nitrogen released. So there's likely to be still some circulating, but if it stays in solution the whole time in the water, you don't care because it's not doing any reaction. It's not coming out, you know, uh, clogging heat exchangers or something like that. So it's okay. So don't worry about that part. It's the part that comes out as we go around the, the uh, piping loop that we care about so much. Okay. Data on the maximum amount of nitrogen that can be in solution expressed as a percent of water volume if released from solution and then expanded to atmospheric pressure at 32 degrees. That just is the axis, the y axis. If water at its solubility, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> limit is heated and or its pressure is reduced, nitrogen will be released from solution. If the nitrogen can be separated, the water will stay in the deaerated condition. Okay. Um, effective air control means designing a system so that when nitrogen is released from solution, either by heating or pressure reduction, it will be at only one point. That's what we'd like. We'd like it to come out here and then we separate it out here and we get it up to the compression tank or if we have an automatic air vents, you know, we might, there might be some venting going on, okay? Uh, this point of separation should be the connecting point to the compression tank. We must have adequate system pressurization because areas of low pressure will allow nitrogen to be released from solution. So you got some area on the backside of the system and all of a sudden something gets clogged and you get a big pressure drop over there that is not supposed to be there, then you're gonna have nitrogen coming out of solution over there and you may or may not. Then the question is, can your, can your uh, water flow bring that nitrogen back to the point of air separation so you can get it out of the system or is it gonna stay over there and accumulate in a coil or something, which is gonna cause you issues. <clears throat> Uh, this means locating all pumps in the system with respect to the point of no pressure change so that their operating pressures are always added to the system pressures existing at each point in the system. Pumps should not be a cause of creating reduced pressure areas at remote points in the system where air can be released from solution. So that's getting that compression tank on the suction side of the pump close to the pump. Uh, ideally, air control is complete and the air separation point, which is the area of highest temperature and lowest pressure. Well, wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> I'm not sure how often that's possible. And so we're gonna have to make some judgments here. This is seldom possible. So the engineer must provide not only effective uh, separation equipment, but design the piping circuitry so that any free air within the system will be carried back to the point where it will be separated and directed to the compression tank. Okay, here's, here's another big number for us. Normally a velocity of two feet per second 
two feet per second will be adequate to prevent free entrainment of air uh, from forming air pockets. Okay, so we got to maintain at least two feet per second if we wanna be sure that we can circulate this air that may have come out of solution back to the point of air separation. High points in various piping circuits can be collection, collecting points for free air. Proper pipe sizing, particularly on down feed return piping is often effective in preventing um, air traps at high points. Um, you can also put um, manual air vents. I talked about the library nursing building at University of Tennessee in Memphis where we had so much trouble getting all the air out of the system. And uh, we had to go drill the tops of the coils and actually put in a manual air vent so we could get all the air out. Sometimes you have to do that. <clears throat> uh, the best location for our air separation equipment depends on the particular system. When possible, select the point that will have the highest temperature and lowest pressure. We said that when this is not possible, the point with highest temperature should receive first consideration as the best point for air separators, even though it is often located at the bottom of the system under full static pressure. So if you've got to select between the two of them, go to the point of highest temperature before you go to the point of highest pressure for your air separation point. Except possibly for high rise building, uh, air separation at points uh, of elevated temperature is generally an effective way to deaerate a system. Further, since boilers are usually protected by pressure relief valves, air, se air separation at or near the boiler supply then places the point of no pressure change near the uh, pressure relief valve. So you got a couple of things working for you there. Okay, uh, this is pretty good. This is just uh, illustrating that uh, say this is my, 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 my return pipe downflow. If I have two feet per second or greater, those air bubbles will go with the flow. And it's fast enough that it will drag them back and you can get them out of the system. If I'm like over here, a half a foot per second or something, the flow is going down and the air bubbles say, forget it, I'm going up and I'm going to accumulate up here and cause you a problem. Okay. So that's the point of that. Okay. Uh, the most common and an effective air separator is the conventional uh, hot water uh, heating boiler. Uh, in boilers with large internal water passages, air velocity is low and uh, free air released in heating can readily rise to a convenient high collection point. From this uh, collecting point, the air can rise into the compression tank to prevent free air from collecting at the top of the boiler and being circulated out into the system and the radiation boiler dip tubes uh, are used either top or side outlet. Some boiler manufacturers provide these dip tubes as standard equipment. It's just an air separation device. And uh, here's a picture of uh, some different configurations, I guess, uh, on the top uh, <clears throat> boiler dip tubes for top outlet boilers. So you see the little fitting up here on top. So the uh, air, the nitrogen, whatever, uh, and the water come up and this fitting is able to, to segregate off the uh, air and send it to the compression tank. And then the hot water goes on out to the system. Uh, here's a different configuration. So there's different ways to set them up. Depends on the boiler. But anyway, so you can have uh, boiler dip tubes for side outlet and boiler dip tubes for reverse flow boilers, where the cold water comes in the top and the hot water comes out the bottom. So there's lots of different configurations. But you just need to be aware that um, that's a good place to uh, where you're going to need an air separator and you can talk to your boiler suppliers about uh, the best way to do that. Um, IAF air separators. Uh, often the boiler is not available as a point of air separation. 
Another low velocity area must be provided in the system as the air separation point. A low velocity air separating tank equipped with a dip tube to create a flow reversal can be effectively used. Tests show that uh, water must be slowed to at least six inches a second or a half foot a second for effective separation um, of free air from a piping circuit. So there's different types of air separators. Uh, this is the IAF, it comes in basically, it just has the water flows down and then back up and you slow it down enough so that the air will flow up to the top and then you got a dip tube up here to separate it. So the idea is have this thing pretty large, the larger the diameter, the slower the, the flow will go through it. So you just slow the flow down and the air will come out, rise to the top. The dip tube pulls it off and you get it out of the system. Uh, a straight through, um, even though it slows the flow, is likely to pass some air through the system. Um, the vertical distance the water must travel and its velocity are directly related to how much air will be separated. Uh, the IAF model with dip tube separator also serves as an effective settling point for sediment and other debris that, you know, could be some crud in the system that you can collect in this and get rid of it. So another benefit. Uh, then there's the roll air troll separators. Uh, roll air troll air separator oper operates by creating a vortex or whirlpool in the center where entrained air uh, can collect and rise into the compression tank installed above. The uh, action of centrifugal force sends the uh, heavier air-free water to the outer portion of the tank, allowing the lighter uh, air-water mixture to move to this, uh, into the lower velocity center. The air collecting screen located in the vortex aids at developing a low velocity area in the center. So these things, and if you look at the piping connections, they're offset. One will be on one side and one will be on the other because you're trying to promote this vortex, this spinning flow as the water flows through this thing. So that's pretty good. Uh, compression tank installation. I tell you what, we're getting pretty close to the end of this. I think I'm gonna go ahead and stop here. I'm about to dry out. And uh, we'll finish this. Uh, I'll send you a, uh, let's see, I need to send you the solution to the second psych problem. Our test is a week from today and I'll be emailing you out a regular test. You will work it and you will scan it and send it back to me. You'll have about an hour and a half to get it back to me. Uh, and then you'll be watching your email for uh, some additional files that'll come on presentation. So I think that's about it. And I hope everybody has a great day. Stay safe and we'll be back in touch.